almost there. You thought we were past Christmas. There are those who when Christmas ends, just like the decorations that we neatly pack away in a box and store on the shelf for another year, there are those who think that is what we do with Christmas. We just set it on the shelf, it is passed for another year, and we move on with our lives. I find it fascinating in the cities out like in Belgrade and here around Bozeman in Missoula as well, uh, the garbage companies set out these great big dumpsters and after Christmas you can come and get rid of your Christmas tree and they recycle them. It is always interesting to me that on the night of Christmas there are already trees that are being thrown into the dumpster. In other words, Christmas has been that morning, open your gifts, decorations gone, tree out of the house, and you move on. But Christmas is bigger than just a day, isn't it? Almost there. Appropriate words for that first Christmas appropriate for Mary and even Joseph on that very first Christmas. From the moment that bump appeared under Mary's robe, it became a time of how much longer? How much longer do I, a pregnant woman, have to deal with the stares and the whispering of this baby and this man who's not even my husband. How much longer? And God's voice, I believe, through Joseph probably told Mary, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. We're almost there. And then on a journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, some 90 miles and probably five days of traveling on the back of a donkey. How appropriate that somewhere along the way, Mary, in the very, very late stages of her pregnancy, might have just once become weary enough to ask Joseph how much longer. We're almost there. Hang in there. And then not always, but it is typical of your first experience in giving birth to a child. I would not know, but I have seen it. That that labor and that period of giving birth is the most difficult of all of them. You don't know what to expect. You have never felt pain like that before. And there in that stable, we can imagine Mary wondering, if not proclaiming, how much longer? No doctor there to say it, but Joseph, perhaps again, hang in there. Just one more hard push. We're almost there. Very appropriate words for Mary and Joseph on that first Christmas. But more appropriate are those words not just for that moment. Because you see, that moment was bigger than Mary and Joseph, bigger than just a baby being born. Almost there was the fulfillment of some 4,000 years of God's children asking, how much longer? How much longer? 
from the beauty of Eden to the lowliness and humbleness of a stable, God's children had been wondering how much longer. From Eve to Mary, God's children wondering how much longer. 4,000 years in a journey that seemingly would never end came to fulfillment on that one night. Almost there became reality. And Jesus was born. On that night, when almost there became reality, there were only two groups of people. John tells us about it in his gospel in your Bibles. If you would turn there with me, John chapter 1, and we want to look at verses 10 through 13. John chapter 1 and verses 10 through 13. Page 1049, if you happen to be using your pew Bible there, John chapter 1. And we'll begin here in verse 10 and read down through verse 13. He, speaking of Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, nor of a husband's will, but born of God. Two groups. Those who were not ready to receive him and knew him not, and those who knew him and would become his what? His children. His children, Mary and Joseph. His children, the shepherds in the fields at night. His children, wise men who followed a star. His children, Anna and Simeon, who patiently waited year after year in the temple, believing that they were almost there. We know the characters well, don't we? Christmas after Christmas, we talk about those who believed, those who therefore are God's children. But I want us to think about it in the context of almost there today. I want us to put in our minds that when almost there became reality, there were only how many groups? There were only two those who believed and received, and those who didn't. Two groups. And of those two groups, those who believed, who followed this Jesus in his life, eventually something interesting began to happen in their understanding of Jesus. It was a very, very slow process, agonizingly slow. But they began to realize that almost there really didn't end in a manger that first Christmas. They began to realize that this journey would continue, perhaps further than any of them even would dare to want it to go. And though the details were fuzzy and though they were slow to catch on, as Jesus' ministry came close to an end, there were some close to him who realized that everything they thought that the kingdom was going to be here on this earth perhaps wasn't going to be the way they had envisioned it. 
And they must have began to realize that this Jesus was going to go through some kind of an experience, some kind of a period of time where he was no longer going to be here, but that one day he would make a second appearance. And one day, those who were closest to him, who at times must have seemed like little kids in the back seat of a car on a trip that had been too long, dared to ask that question again. Matthew chapter 24 in verse 3. With me in your Bibles there, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, page 982, just a couple Gospels before John here. Matthew 24 and verse 3. And we can picture almost Jesus at the steering wheel, those obnoxious 12 in the back seat, and the trip has been too long, and here comes that question. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, and they said this, Tell us, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your what? Your coming. And the end of what? The age. See, we always figure the disciples were a little on the dense side and really didn't understand everything. But you see, as Jesus' ministry is coming to an end, somehow, some way, they have in their minds that this journey is not over right now, that there is more to come, and one day it will be Jesus who again is the one who is what? Coming back. And from the back seat of the car, we hear the question, Jesus how long? How long is it going to be till you come back? Already in their minds, they were wanting to be with who again? With Jesus. They may not have fully understood, and certainly they didn't, but they knew enough to know that they wanted to be with who? With Jesus. And if he was going somewhere, they wanted to know when he was going to come back. How much longer, Jesus, till you come back? We don't want to be away from you. How much longer till this is all over? From the front seat, Jesus answers back. We're almost there. And this is how you know that. Verses 4 through 8 in chapter 24, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of the birth pains, the NIV says. How appropriate. The birth pains. These signs aren't telling us that it's here. It's telling us that we're almost there. I remember from my days in the print shop back in Missoula, a business card, I don't remember his last name, but I won't forget his first name, it was Jack, and the reason I can't remember, or forget his first name rather, would be what was on the back of his business card. He worked for Lambros Realty, and that was on the front with his picture and all of his information, but on the back was a picture of a stork, and out of the stork's beak was a blanket that was folded, and inside of the blanket was a baby. And underneath of it was this phrase, no labor pains, Jack, just the baby. In other words, he was telling us 
that if you hired him as your realtor, no pain, no issues, no problems, just at the end, what you're looking for, the baby, the new house or your house being sold. Moms who have been through the experience, if you could sign up nine months ahead of time, no labor pains, just the baby, would you sign on the dotted line? I suspect most would. I know I would, and I didn't even have to go through it. I just had to go through it with somebody. And I'd have just assumed she didn't have that. No labor pains, just the baby. Is that what God promised? No, he said there's going to be some birth pains. There are signs that are telling you we're almost there. And then I will do what? I'll come back. And from that generation to today, the signs that Jesus talks about in what we read and the rest of Matthew 24, for that matter, have occurred over and over again, generation to generation. When we read Paul's writings in the New Testament, we come to understand that he and his fellow believers truly believe that Jesus was going to return in their lifetime. They were almost there. And every generation since has seen every one of these signs fulfilled right in front of their very eyes and have believed we are almost there. I have mentioned this more than once in my time here, but as a little seven or eight-year-old boy, I believed with all of my heart that Jesus was coming soon and that I would never, ever have to worry about my grandparents dying before Jesus came. We're almost there. And yet today, my parents are in the same place as my grandparents were when I thought those things. And I am far older than I ever, ever dreamed of being here on this earth. And the signs just keep coming. And we just keep driving by. And there's more signs. And we keep driving, and there's more signs, and we keep driving. And I'm reminded of a trip I made to South Dakota, chaperoning the boys in my daughter Skyla's eighth grade graduation trip. We were headed to see Mount Rushmore. The moment we got into South Dakota, there were signs that began to appear at least every mile. Now, if you have something as wonderful as Mount Rushmore in your state, that's what I would be putting on the signs. But there was nothing about Mount Rushmore on any of those signs. Matter of fact, the first knowledge that Mount Rushmore was coming up was when you're almost to Rapid City and you start seeing the signs that say, if you want to go there, you need to turn on this highway. But from the moment we entered into South Dakota, there were these signs talking about this place called Wall Drug. Five cent cups of coffee, free ice water, dinosaur exhibits, homemade donuts, Whatever in the world you could think about, they would put on those signs and they just kept happening. Wall drug, just ahead. You're almost there, wall drug. And you would anticipate that sooner or later you would come there, but by the time we got to Rapid City, there was no sign of wall drug. It must still be just ahead. Now, I wasn't part of planning the trip and I don't know how it came about, 
Perhaps it was planned into the trip that they would go to Waldrug. Perhaps those eighth graders in the car seeing the signs became curious enough that they talked their teachers into wanting to go. But on the next to last day in South Dakota, we headed out from Rapid City, headed towards Waldrug. Great anticipation because there's a sign every mile. This place has to be pretty cool. And the signs just continue. And if you've ever been in South Dakota, it's a long ways across South Dakota. And even though it isn't on the far eastern edge, it might as well be, because when it keeps saying it's just ahead, you think you're eventually going to get there. We got there a little bit before 5 o'clock. We had stopped at a place that was some prairie dog ghost town kind of a deal. It had a one log cabin sitting out in the middle of nowhere. You couldn't get out of your car and go see it. You pulled in this little parking lot, and from here to the back of the church, you got to look at a broken down cabin that was sitting there. And if you looked out in the fields, there were indeed real prairie dogs jumping up and down and having a good time. And it was a great adventure. But while drug was still ahead, and at around 5 o'clock, we pulled into Waldrug. And I don't know about the kids, but I've never been as disappointed in a trip in my life. <laughs> Waldrug is about like going to Walmart. It isn't on the top of my list. The best part about it is since they were closing for the day, those homemade donuts, they had a bunch of them left. And since these 8th grade kids had come all the way from Bozeman, Montana, just to see Wall Drug, they gave us all of their leftover donuts that they didn't sell for the day. Just what you want 8th graders to have on a long trip back to Rapid City, right? But sign after sign after sign, and then that's what you get at the end. It's a long drive with lots of reminders that something is just ahead. And I haven't been here since Jesus was here nearly 2,000 years ago. But in my nearly 54 years, it's been a long, long drive. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting weary of the trip. I'm getting tired of the signs. I've seen enough of them. I don't need to see how much worse an earthquake can get. I don't need to see how many more kids can die in a famine. I don't need to see how much more creative we can get as a sick human race and how we kill one another in wars. I'm tired of seeing the signs. In all honesty, I am tired of hearing we're almost there. I am becoming the kid in the back seat who's tired beyond tired of waiting to get there. And I don't know, maybe I'm alone in that. Maybe as we come to the end of yet another year without Jesus returning, maybe it isn't that big of a disappointment to you. Maybe life here is just fun enough to make it seem like it's not that big of a deal. But as I look at the end of another year and what has transpired behind us and knowing what we will face ahead of us, I'm not excited about parts of the journey. I'm excited about a lot of things that can happen on the journey I'm excited about a lot of things God is going to do on this journey, but there are parts of the journey that I've had enough of. I'm tired of the signs. 
I'm tired of almost there. And I hope today you are as well. Because if you're not tired of where we're at, if you're not disappointed that Jesus didn't come this past year, perhaps we need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves what group are we in as we are waiting for the reality of almost there to happen. It's like the little boy whose daddy has been over in Iraq for far too long. We weren't still even supposed to be there. In those once in a great whiles when daddy can call home, after mommy has talked, the little boy gets to get on the phone. And the conversation has ended the same way for the last couple of years. I can't wait to see you, son. I'll be home soon. Well, when you've heard that over and over and daddy never comes home, it begins to become empty. So the little boy says, daddy, that's what you always say, but you never come home. There's a deep sigh on the phone that daddy hears. And following that sigh, the little boy's voice says, daddy, I just want to know when I can be where you are again. No more promises, Dad. I just want to know when I can be with you again. I believe our world today is sighing and crying out, how much longer, God, till we can be with you again. How much longer is it going to be we're almost there? There's only one answer that will see us through. And that answer depends 100% today on which group you have chose to be in. Because you see, those who are God's children are those who trust and those who believe. Those who are God's children are those who, even though it is long and even though they are growing weary, they keep their eyes heavenward because their redemption is near. They believe and they trust that they're almost there. Though they may have to drive by more signs than they ever want to see, they realize they're almost there. And I will tell you today that we are almost there. And you can believe that, not because Pastor Jim said it, but you can believe it because Jesus said it. We all know this verse by heart, or many of us do, but I want you to turn in your Bibles to one last verse today. I'm going to read it from the King James Version because I think that's how we probably all learned it when we were kids. But John chapter 14 and verses 1 through 3. Just the chapter and the verses should remind you of what we are about to read. John 14 and verses 1 to 3. And you have to love the way Jesus starts out this promise. Let not your heart be what? Be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled, even though you are tired, even though you are weary, even though you don't want to see one more sign go by. Let not your heart 
be troubled because we are almost there. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. That's why you got to love the King James, right? Some of the other translations, you just get rooms. I say we stick with the King James here and go for the mansion, right? It's been a long trip. If it were not so, I would have what? Told you. What's Jesus asking us to do there? To trust. To believe. If it wasn't true, when I told you we are almost there, I wouldn't have told you. Trust me, we are almost there. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Like a little boy who wants to be where his daddy is. As believers, as God's children today, don't you want to be where daddy is? We're almost there. He said so. And he has shown us over and over again. You may be weary of the signs, but don't miss their importance. It is Jesus telling you that we're almost there.